All right, now John chapter 16, of course, again, and I mentioned this in, when, when I've preached the other sermons, you know, these are continuations, like John chapter 16, it's, it's broken up into a new chapter, we're looking at it a week later, but this is really just a continuation of what Jesus was saying in John 15. And if you remember in John 15, we talked about one of the main um, subjects of John 15 was the fact that he was sending the comforter to comfort him, and he was preparing them in warning them and letting them know, hey, you're going to be sad. And this is what he's doing again in John chapter 16. You know, there's going to be hard times that are going to come, but don't worry. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. You're going to have the Holy Ghost is going to come and he's going to comfort you. And I'm not going to leave you alone. You know, you're going to be sad, but then, but then joy is going to come. And that's what he's saying here in John 16. So in John 16 verse 1, he says, these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. He doesn't want them to, to, to be offended at the things that are going to happen. He doesn't want them to be shaken in their faith. He doesn't want them to, to have, um, you know, this word offended, I don't think it's exactly the same way that we use it today. When someone says something, um, you know, maybe critical, like, oh, I'm so offended. Um, but it's very, very, very similar to that. And, and really what it is, it's, I think it's kind of like being shaken in mind. You know, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. He doesn't want them being troubled. He, doesn't, he, has, he wants them to know what's coming in advance to help them to get through things. And this is one of the best things. You, you know, when you know in advance things are going to happen, it's always easier to go through hard times when you already know. It's already, you know, a, a foregone conclusion, right? Uh, for example, dealing with death. It's never an easy thing, you know, it's, it's usually not, right? Um, but when someone gets old, when someone's sick, when someone's been in a certain condition for an extended period of time, and you know it's going to happen, and it, you know it's going to happen real soon, or something, you know, something to that effect, it's usually a little bit easier to deal with and to accept. It's kind of already had time in your mind to kind of go over some of this and thinking, okay, you know, my loved one here, they're... They're, they're near the end, and, and anything short of a miracle, they're going to pass away, as opposed to someone who just very abruptly just dies. Um, when it comes at you as a shock, it's a lot harder to deal with those things. And that's what Jesus is telling you. He's like, I don't want you to be shocked by this. I'm telling you, we have the word of truth here. We have God's words so that we, don't, we shouldn't have to be surprised or shocked at things that happen in our life. And Jesus is, is really being careful to, to, to let them know, to let his disciples know, and to let us know about tribulation, about trials, and about things that are going to happen in our lives so that they don't have a, too bad, a negative of an impact on us, so that we're not caught off guard. I mean, think about someone, if, you, if you're in a fight with someone, you know, in, in a boxing match, you know that that other person is going to come and he's going to be throwing punches and you got your guard up. Right? You're ready. You, you, you're trying not to get hit or knocked out. Well, when someone comes and just blindsides you, right, that's going to do a whole bunch of damage. It'll knock you out, knock you silly, whatever, because um, you don't see it coming. And what Jesus is doing is, is trying to let them see, hey, this is coming. There's, I'm, I'm leaving you soon. And I'm letting you know about it now so that you can prepare yourselves. And we as Christians today need to be prepared for tribulation in our life. We need to be prepared for hard times. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, in, in just preparedness in general and, and being able to be self-sufficient and, and kind of provide for yourself. And that goes in, um, in many aspects of life. right? I'm not just talking about like prepping and having a bunch of food. I, I think it's wise to do that. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I don't think that means you don't have faith in God if you, if you store up a little bit of food, especially when you know something is going to come. When you know that there's going to be bad times coming, what do you do? You prepare. And you should, you should take comfort in the fact that God has told us in advance. And why did he tell us? He told us so we could just be prepared for things. We need to be prepared. That's why he said, you know, basically not to be surprised if the world hates you. He's like, don't let that affect you. The world hates me. Yo, you're not, the servant's not greater than his master. If they, did, if they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more his servants? So he's saying, look, this happened to me. Expect it. It's going to happen. Don't be surprised. Don't let it shock you. 
It's going to happen. And he's just given us these warnings. So we see these warnings. Look at, look at verse number 2. He says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. So he's saying, look, people are going to be so against you, but they're, they're, in their mind, they're going to think that by killing you, they're actually pleasing to God. They're going to think like, like they're going to have their belief system that God is happy with them for exterminating you and for killing you, who is a true child of God. Right. And this is the way I mean, Muslims think this way today. Some of them, the extremist ones do. Right. The, the, the ones that the, the, I, you know, I call it extremists, but it's really the ones that actually believe the writings of the Quran. You know, the, the true Muslims, the ones that, that believe what's actually taught in their religion. They're the ones that that, um, you know, they believe that the infidels should be put to death. And if and when they are to carry that out. They think God is pleased with me because I'm carrying out the work of God. And this is what Jesus is warning his disciples about is what's going to happen to them. And that is what happened to them. Many of, of the disciples of Jesus Christ were martyred. They were put to death. John the Baptist was put to death. There was, you know, other Peter was put to death. That was not a way that he wanted to die. You know, he, there, there was many of, of the disciples of Jesus Christ and the people that killed them, just as the Jews thought, or some of the Jews at least, they thought that they were doing God service by killing Jesus because they thought Jesus was not of God, that he was of the devil. So when you're, when you're putting to death you know, one of Satan's ministers, then you're doing a good thing in God's eyes. That's what they thought. And Jesus is just warning us, saying, hey, look, the people are doing this, they're dead set against you, and they're going to think that they're actually doing God a favor, that they're doing God's service. Verse 3 says, And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said unto you at the begin these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. So now he's just he's just prepping them. He's getting them ready. He's saying, Look, I didn't tell you all these hard times to come because I was with you. When Jesus Christ is here, you have nothing to worry about. You know, he's here. He's going to protect you. He's going to take care of you. But when he's going away, they're going to come after you is what he's saying. So I didn't have to tell you about it before, but now I'm letting you know. And I'm also letting you know now that when these things do come to pass, you're going to remember. You say, oh yeah, Jesus told me about this. And we as Christians, we need to get that into our heads that if just because you're living a righteous life doesn't mean your life's going to be a bed of roses and that everything's going to fall into place for you and that God is just going to make every single thing work out um, without you having any type of, uh, of uh, persecutions or troubles or anything like that. Now, in the end, all things work for good to those that love God, to them that are called according to His promise. Yes, that is absolutely true. But that's in the end, right? The end of all things. It's not the whole way. It's not the beginning, the middle, and the end. It's the end. The end of all things will work out good for those that love God. And loving God is by keeping His commandments and doing that which He told us to do. So when we're living right, He doesn't promise it's just a, a cakewalk for, through, the, through our lives. There will be, and, and the Bible says, yeah, and all that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We're going to get to that in a minute here. But, um, Jesus is, gives his disciples this warning because he knows his hour has come. He knows it's time for him to go. And in chapter 15, he was exhorting and comforting his disciples, as I already mentioned, explaining how he's going to give them the Holy Ghost. And he also mentions that in this chapter as well. And it's all preparation for his departure. Now, these verses all kind of go together because he's warning them with the last verse of the chapter. Look at verse 33. The Bible reads, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus tells them, look, in the world you are going to have tribulation. It's, there's no doubt about it. He says, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, we're going to focus on that last verse because it's kind of a, 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 that last verse gives an overall theme for this chapter. And it's a theme of just being prepared, being ready, and knowing that tribulation is going to come. We as Christians shall have persecution. We need to be ready for that. We need to be ready mentally for that. 
It's something you need to, to expect. Look at um, Job as a great example. Right? Job was a man. He was the most righteous man in all of the earth at the time that he was living. There was not a greater man than Job on the earth. He was doing right by God. He was doing his sacrifice. He was doing everything that he was supposed to be doing. He's still a sinner, okay? He wasn't sinlessly perfect. But when you compare Job to the rest of the people on the earth, Job was at the top. He was number one. He was, he was the best Christian. He was the best believer in God. But what happened to him? He went through way more tribulation and trials than we've ever gone through. At least anyone I know in this room no one has gone through the things that Job has gone through that's here today with losing his children, losing, his fi losing everything, getting diseased, everything. I mean, it, it, it's, it's hard to even imagine and comprehend what that must be like to go through those things, especially as someone who's, hey, I'm doing right by God. Why? And that's, that's kind of what he's saying. Why is this happening to me? I don't, he didn't understand. You know, he knew he wasn't in sin. He wasn't doing some grievous sins. And, you know, so he didn't, he didn't understand what was happening. But he was being tried. And persecution came. And who did the persecution come from? Did it come from God? No. It came from the devil. The devil wants to attack you when you are doing good. When, when God sees someone doing right, the devil is going to come along and be like, yeah, right. Wait till there's a little bit of hardship in his life. He's going to curse you, God. And he's, and he's an accuser. And he's our enemy, and he's, he's going to come and, and, and try to get us into sin and try to get us to curse God and try to get us out of church and try to get us to quit on serving God. That's where the persecution is ultimately going to be coming from. Satan's going to be attacking you when you are doing right. See, Satan doesn't want you going out and winning souls. Satan doesn't want you cleaning up your life so that God could use you even more. That's going against his evil works. He's going to try to stop you. That's, then that's why the, the subject of, of us being soldiers in the battlefield, it's a spiritual battle that we're fighting because the devil's going to come and, and, try to, and, and his minions are going to come and try to attack us. Especially when he sees you're getting your armor on. You're ready for a fight. They're going to come and, and bring the trials and the tribulations and the persecutions. And it's going to happen and we need to be aware of this. Now, there's so many Christians today, we're going to go into this a little bit. I'm not going to spend the entire sermon on this, but a significant chunk on the, the lie of the pre-tribulation rapture. Because it's, it's so prevalent today. I'm glad a lot of people are waking up to this. Um, but it's, it's teaching, and it's inherently teaching a, a concept of not being prepared of unpreparedness, of not having to worry about the trials and tribulations that are going to come in your life because Jesus is going to come back and, he's going to, and we're not going to have to experience any, any trouble. When things get bad, we'll be gone. And that's what, that's what that lie teaches. And we're going to see, we're going to expose just one aspect of that lie because it's called, you know, the, their doctrine is called the pre-tribulation rapture. And I'm not going to go into everything that they believe, but pre-tribulation means before the tribulation. And they call it the great tribulation, okay? Before any of that starts, and they consider the tribulation to be a seven-year period, which it's not. The tribulation only lasts for about the first half of that seven-year period. The second half is always referred to as God's wrath, not as tribulation. But we're going to see, and, and I gave you those handouts, those pieces of paper, because... On those, those pieces of paper, these are all of the scriptural references to the word tribulation, whether it's singular or plural, that are found in the entire Bible. And we're doing this on purpose because, again, if we're going to be looking at a doctrine like the pre-tribulation rapture, you would think that somewhere in the Bible, it's going to tell us that before the tribulation, we will be gone. Like we, we could find that in here. So I decided to look up every instance of the word tribulation and see who does tribulation even apply to. Does it apply to the lost world or does it apply to God's people? Because we saw already in John 16, 33, the last verse, he says, These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have peace. Tribulation. 
but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus Christ is telling Christians right there, you're going to have tribulation, right? Now, okay, maybe he's not talking about the great tribulation. Fine. I, I, that's, I have no problem saying that. and I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think he's telling them that, hey, in this world, you are going to have tribulation. You're going to have trials. Christian, it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have troubles and problems that you're going to go through. But I'm doing this because, you know, if, you, if you're going to call a doctor and, you, and you're going to be referencing tribulation, let's just look up every time the word tribulation is used. So instead of you guys having to flip to all these references, I just printed them out. And you could take them home, and I'm not going to read them all in context. Read them all in context. So you can see what this is really referring to. And I, I'm going to explain the context to you, but go ahead and when you get the time, bring us home and, and look them up and see what is, who is being referred to in, this tri in these tribulations when it's using that word tribulation. Deuteronomy 4.30 is the first reference. It's on your handout there. He says, When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice. And he goes on and on. In Deuteronomy 4, it's Moses explaining to the children of Israel, you know, this is what's going to happen. You do this. You know, when you, when you deny the Lord and he brings trouble and, and, and all these problems on you and people coming at you, if you turn back to the Lord and serve him, then he'll rescue you out of those times. That's what this is talking about. That's in Deuteronomy 4. So it's being addressed to the children of Israel, people who are, would, you know, we'll call them God's people, right? It's, it's referred to people who, by and large, would be saved people, believers in the Lord. Judges 10, 14. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Again, this is, this is towards the children of Israel. Now you say, go and cry unto the gods you have chosen. Maybe they weren't saved because they were worshiping other gods. But he's saying that tribulation is going to come upon them. And he says, you know, let, let those gods. But in, this, in the context, they're saying, no, you know, we're going to serve the Lord. Right? So again, I believe this is still talking to believers because they're saying, no, no, no. You know, we're not going to go to those false gods. We know we did wrong, but we're getting right with God. And that's who he's talking to. 1 Samuel 10, 19. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. So, Again, this is Samuel talking to the children of Israel. This is when they wanted Saul to be king, or they just wanted a king in general, when they were, they were ditching the idea of having judges and they wanted a king to rule over them. And Samuel's telling them, look, you're rejecting God to be your ruler, is essentially what you're doing. He's explaining that to them. And he's explaining that God has already saved them out of adversities and tribulations, so why are you rejecting him now? Right? And again, they went through tribulations as God's people. That's what this reference is to. 1 Samuel 26, 24. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. This is David speaking in context here. Again, read it for yourself. This is when um, Saul has been chasing after David. He wants to kill him. And Saul's in, in his camp and he's right in the middle and all of his men are sleeping all around him. And David and one of his men go, and they go, they could have killed him easily. And his servant's just like, let me, you know, let me just, let me stab him with my spear. He's like, I won't have to do it a second time. He'll be dead. And, and David said, no, no. And, um, and they left, and, you know, and, and, and there's that whole story. That's what this is. And David's basically saying, look, um, he's saying, let God, let him deliver me out of all tribulation. David went through all kinds of tribulations in his life. Saul was trying to kill him. There was battles, there was fights, there was all kinds of things going on. David was a man of God. He was a man after God's own heart. Those are all the references from the Old Testament. Now the New Testament, Matthew 13, 21, Jesus speaking here, he says, Yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. And this is very important because this ties in exactly with what we're talking about. Now, this parable, it's a parable of the sower, right? The sower soweth the seed. Some falls into, you know, by the wayside. 
Some falls into stony ground. Some falls into good ground. Um, the, you know, the stuff by the wayside, they were never saved. They never received, you know, before they could even believe on the word, the devil comes and he snatches it out of their heart and, and snatches it away from them. But the other ones is talking about, you know, it doeth for a while. Now, all of the other examples in this parable, we're not going to go through it just for the sake of time. I'll do it another day. But um, they're, all the rest of them are saved because all of them, it says they received the seed. They, they believed on Christ. And that's all you have to do to be saved. They believed. But some of them, the ones that weren't planted in the good ground, the fertile ground, the ones that, that ended up growing up and producing fruit and, and are you know, living for God and doing right, those other, one, the other ones that got saved, yeah, they got in church for a while. They started to do good. But it says, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. And, and, and I'm sure you've probably seen this already. And it's happened even in this church. People will come in. They'll get started for a while. They get saved. They start, you know, they start to grow. And then what happens? The cares of this world get involved in their life. They like a sin. There's something going on. And it pulls them out. Or... I've seen this happen with other people, kind of a little bit more specific with this reference. They start experiencing tribulation or persecution because of the word, because of what they believe. I've known people who started coming to church, but then their family members start giving them a hard time. Oh, you believe that? Oh, you're going to that church? They're crazy. They're fanatics. They're lunatics. We, you know, and, and they'll start getting this persecution. And a lot of people just... They don't have the strength. They can't stand up to that. They don't want to deal with that. And they let them get them out of church. And it happens. They're offended, right? It lets them get shaken and, and, and not grounded and rooted down in the truth and in the church where they should be. And notice how this lines up. He says, for when tribulation persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. Jesus is telling us these things so that we don't be offended. That's what he said in John 16, 1 was the first verse. He was saying that these things that I told you that, you, you know, that you're not offended. We need to understand these things so that when, when the tribulation and persecution do come, we aren't offended. We know that they're coming. Matthew 24. Again, talking, this is, and this is very specifically talking about the end times. Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Matthew 24, 29 is the next reference. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And I'm going to turn there so we can keep reading because it's, it's not on this list. I just did the actual individual verses. But we're going to see in this specific reference how the rapture, and this is specifically, this is, the one, of the, this is like one of the few verses that use the word tribulation and references the rapture. Okay, so these people believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't know why they don't turn to Matthew 24 because we'll see. We're going to go through all the references and we'll see how many of these references, the ones that we talked to already, they're not talking about the rapture. The ones in the Old Testament, we're not talking about the rapture. They're talking about, you know, saved people or God's people going through hard times, but no evidence or reference whatsoever to Jesus Christ's second return and us being caught up together with him in the clouds. No reference whatsoever. We have that here in Matthew 24. We're reading in, in verse 29. I'll read it again. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the tribulation that we were just reading about in Matthew 24, 21, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, His return, His second coming. The Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. They're gathered together. The elect, the saved, the Christians are gathered together. They're caught up with Christ because he's coming in the clouds and he catches up his saints to be with him. 
This is the rapture, and it happens immediately after the tribulation of those days. This is the most clear scripture on tribulation and rapture. And it very clearly states it's afterwards. So how could you have a pre-tribulation? It doesn't make any sense. But let's keep going. Let's look at some more of these references. We're going to get to, to more of John 16, but I want to make sure we get through this. It's an important doctrine because we, did, we, don't, we don't know. I believe, and I don't know this for a fact but by any means. Nobody does. But I believe that we will be here. If we live out our, like uh, an average lifespan for us right here in this room, if I live to be, say, somewhere in my 70s, I fully believe that Jesus Christ will return before then. I think that the way things are going and the way things are lining up. Now, I know there's been a lot of people throughout history who have kind of felt the same way. But I think now, more than ever, we can see how, how all of these things can be implemented with the one world government and with the, you know, taking the mark of the beast. And you could, you could just see with technology and the way things are going, how, how much clearer God's word is to us today than it were for people even just 100 years ago. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think that. But I could be wrong. So what if I'm wrong? It's still going to happen. It's still going to come. We know it's going to come. It's not going to take that much longer either. But we need to know about these things, especially if he does come back. If, if, these, if, if the great tribulation happens in our lifetime, we dead sure want to make sure we're not offended when that happens. We need to be mentally prepared. We need to be as prepared as possible. We need to be thinking about these things so that, hey, what are we going to do and say, oh, okay, well, I'm prepared. Well, what about helping other Christians? What about helping other people? How, am I, how are we going to go through this? How are we going to help people out and, and kind of realize what's going to happen? Play it out in your head. We don't want to be caught off guard. Mark 13 is the next reference here on your sheet. Mark 13 is, again, it's a parallel passage to Matthew 24. Mark 13, 24, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. So here's another reference. And I'm going to turn to this one real quick to, to, to the rapture and the tribulation. Mark 13. It says in verse 25, And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then shall he send his angels, and he shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Again, it's the, it's the same thing. It's talking about the angels coming and gathering up the elect. And, and that's the rapture. And it's funny because the people who believe in the, in the pre-tribulation rapture, they don't like to look at this, this section of Scripture, but they're all about going to the part that's later on in the, in the chapter. It says in verse uh, 35, you know, watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And they'll say, oh yeah, that's talking about the rapture. Or like in Matthew 24, I, should, I didn't go over this then, but I'm flipping back there real quick right now because this is the one they really like to use. Is um, Verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And it goes on and on, and it, and it talks about, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. And he talks about there are two being in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Obviously talking about the rapture. And they'll say, oh yeah, this is talking about it, but, but everything that came before that had nothing to do with it. It's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. The, the, it's a stupid doctrine. And um, don't be deceived by that. But let's keep going here. John 16, we already read that one. Acts 14, 22 says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Now, this kind of can have a twofold meaning in this verse because he's talking about confirming the souls of the disciples, right? Those that are following Christ. This is after Jesus Christ's resurrection. This is after all that's in Acts, Acts 14. And Letting, you know, just, just confirming the souls, exhorting them, continuing the faith, and to warn them that we must go through tribulation. And he says, we must through 
much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Well, what's the kingdom of God? That's how we're going to get into heaven. Or, you know, if you think of God's kingdom being brought down on this earth for the millennial reign of Christ, we have to go through tribulation in order to enter into his kingdom. So in the end times, we're going to need to go through the tribulation or even just in our personal lives. If you're a disciple, if you're living godly, if you're doing that which is right, you are going to go through tribulation. That's what this is saying. Again, directed, either way, directed towards believers, directed towards disciples. Romans 2.9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Um, Romans 5.3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And this is again talking about believers. Romans 8.35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Again, talking about referencing believers. Romans 12.12, 12, rejoice in hope, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Again, referencing believers. 2 Corinthians 1.4, who, who comforteth, comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Again, referring to believers. 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Again, referencing believers. Ephesians 3, 13. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Again, a believer reference there in Ephesians 3. 1 Th Thessalonians 3, 4. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and ye know. Again, believers, 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Guess what? Again, let's talk about believers. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now, this is talking about people who are troubling Christians. Okay, so here's one example that, that God's going to bring tribulation to someone that troubles you. Uh, Revelation 1, 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ, um, John, a companion in tribulation. John was no stranger to tribulation. Revelation 2, 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. This is talking to a church of believers. I know thy works and tribulation. Revelation 2, 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So who's doing the persecuting here? It's the devil. The devil is persecuting the church, and he's saying, you're going to have tribulation. It's going to come from the devil. That's who's going to be persecuting you, and it's going to, you're going to be cast into prison. You know, you're going to be experiencing these problems. But be faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Hey, it's a crown. You're just going to have a, a glorious reward by being a martyr for Jesus Christ, by not backing down, by just staying strong no matter what happens to you, by not being offended and just continuing to the end. Revelation 2.22, Behold, I will cast her, this is talking about Jezebel, into a bed and them that committed, commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. This is talking about God punishing um, people in the church that were committing adultery with that with Jezebel, that woman that was suffered to teach. Um, you could read about that in context too. And then Revelation 7, 14, the last reference, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is the reference to the saints, to the people that were raptured, that were, that were caught up, and they came out of great tribulation. Um, again, in Revelation 7 there, we see, we see referring to Christians in heaven that have gone through great, they were going through the great tribulation, and then they ended up in heaven. Christians, we are going to go through that. The, the pre-tribulation rapture is a lie. We just looked up, we looked at 
every single and almost every single verse of the of, that we that the word tribulation is used, almost every single one is talking about believers. It's talking about God's people going through tribulation. Why in the world would you think that all of a sudden, you know, Christians have throughout history been going through tribulation, have been going through serious hardships, and have been being martyred and sawn asunder. Read Hebrews 10. And people who have, who have gone through and have had all these horrible things happen to them because of their faith in Jesus Christ, they suffered, they bled, they died. Yet all of a sudden, the Great Tribulation, we're not going to go through it at all. That doesn't make any sense. All of those references, almost every single one is talking about believers going through tribulation, and especially the ones that are referring to end times events is talking about believers going through the tribulation and that the rapture doesn't happen until after the tribulation. So um, let's keep going here with John 16. I can't pass that up because the whole purpose of John 16, one, he said, well, not the entire purpose, but he's, he's, he's trying to warn them. And he, he said, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. We need to pay attention to this and, and make sure that we are not offended. We're not shaken. These things don't happen to us by surprise. It's, it's easy to sit in our church and be comfortable, and our lives are real comfortable. We have a lot of things going for us. You know, we, we don't go hungry. We've got food. We've got clothing. We've got a vehicle. Our lives are pretty comfortable. Yeah, we may be busy and doing a lot of things, but we have it easy. We are not going through a tribulation like the Bible talks about. When the Bible talks about wars, rumors of wars, famine, pestilence, disease, you know, going hungry, not having things, we need to be ready for that. Are you ready for that? Do you know what it's like to even go hungry? Think about that. We don't know what's going to be happening. Hey, when you can't buy or sell because you refuse to take the mark of the beast and you run out of food, is it going to be the first time you've ever felt hungry in your life? Think about that. If you're going to be prepared, if you're not going to be offended, if you're not going to be soon shaken, maybe you ought to start preparing for that now. And one very good way to do that is by fasting. Withhold food from yourself. Yes, in times when you have plenty. Withhold that from yourself. And there's a lot of... I'm going I'm to preach a sermon about past, uh, of fasting, I think, on Sunday. It's a very good topic, and, and, and hopefully everyone will be here for that. But there is a lot that you can learn and a lot that you can help you to grow by fasting. And one of the things that's going to help, and I'll mention it again on Sunday, is, is being ready for, for hard times. We need to, to make sure we... Think about these things as real events because they are real events. It seems like it's off in the future. It seems like it's just words on a paper sometimes. But this is reality. This is truth. We need to make sure we're ready for it. That's one of the reasons why you know, we have a little bit of, whenever I can, try to get some food, try to get some other things, other valuables, some guns and bullets. And, you know, all this other stuff. I don't go crazy overboard. You know, I'm not like... Um, I'm not, it's not what I'm all about by any means, but I just think it's a wise thing to be able to protect yourself, to be able to defend yourself, to be able to, to feed your family if, when, when, if a famine does come, even if it's not the Great Tribulation. I mean, think about what would happen if, if our electric grid goes down, if other things happen, if, there, you know, if, uh, if, the food, if God judges our nation and the food supply just starts going down because crop fails, crops start to fail and, and you know, we go through a drought and, and God's just judging us and he says, okay, because it's happened plenty of times in the past. God has control over the weather. He can make it so that the food supply just... And you will go hungry. And we're living in a wicked nation today. And we, we can go through that, that tribulation just as much as everyone else can if we're, if we're stuck in the midst of a, of a wicked nation. That's, I mean, there's lots of good reasons to be prepared. But... What he's talking about here in John 16, and most importantly, is if you're living righteously and godly, you are going to be attacked. It will happen to you. It's not a, well, God might judge this nation and we might go through a famine. If you are, if you are living godly, if you're living righteously, you will be attacked. Satan is going to attack you. But let's keep going on here in this chapter. We're going to finish out the rest of this. Um, let's keep reading here. Where were we? Verse 6 in John 16. So we're back to John 16. 
Um, well, let's read in verse 5. I don't know if we read that, actually. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whither goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, these are great words of you. I love what he says here. And, you know, more preachers need to pay attention to the words of Jesus Christ here in verse number 6 and verse number 7. Jesus is telling his disciples something here that makes them very sad. It makes them depressed. They don't like to hear that Jesus is going away. Right? Sorrow hath filled their heart because Jesus is explaining to them, look, you're going to go through trouble. You're going to go through tribulation. You're going to have hard times and I'm not going to be here. But look what he says in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It may make you sad. It may not be pleasant. You might not like, it might not be something you're going to be looking forward to going through tribulation. Nevertheless, I'm going to tell you the truth. You need to hear about this, and it's, and it's for your own good. You could try to hide your head in the sand, but that's not going to stop the events that are going to happen from happening. You cannot stop what is going to happen. You can't stop the great tribulation. It's going to happen. It's prophesied. It will happen. They couldn't stop Jesus Christ being taken and crucified on the cross. It had to happen. And Jesus was going to make sure it was going to happen because he was doing it to save us, to, to pay for our sins. Now, it's not that in and of itself, just, just thinking Jesus being taken from him, that wasn't good news, even though it really was because of, because of what he was doing for us. They didn't understand that at the time. They were sorrowful. They were sad. And sometimes, you know, we hear things from the Bible that might make us sad. It stings sometimes to hear I've been doing this this whole time and that's wrong and I could see God's reaction and, and, and he's really angry about this. And that's what, what King Josiah had that reaction to. They were sad. He, when, when, they, when they read the book of the law, he's like, wow, we've been doing these, my fathers, we've been doing these things that are so wrong and wicked He's like, God's going to judge it. And they were sad. They, they sat in, in sackcloth and ashes and they grieved and they, were, and they were trying to plead with God so they could get right with God when they found out the truth. But they didn't just, just say, oh, well, just, let's just put that back on the shelf, God's word, and just not look at that again because I don't like what it says. That makes me sad. I just want to be happy all the time. No. And a good preacher is not going to withhold the truth from you. Jesus is the best preacher in the world. And he said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, even though it makes you sad. Even though it's not something you want to hear right now, you've got to hear this is for your own good. And this is, you know, I, I'm glad that there are churches getting started up now where the preachers are not afraid to, to make people in the congregation sad or to make them angry or whatever. Because obviously it's not the goal. That's not the intention, but it is a result of hearing God's word. But nevertheless, even if that happens, you're going to hear the truth. And that's why Jesus is even trying to explain it to him. It is expedient for you that I go away. It's good for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. You know, um, and just a, a quick example to this. There was a, a couple that got saved from soul winning and was visiting our church. And they seemed... You know, they seem really interested in wanting to do the right thing and getting right with God. And I was trying to tell them, hey, well, you're in the right place because, you know, well, I'm going to teach you the truth from God's Word. And they, um, they weren't married, but they were dating and they wanted to get married, but, the, but one of them was already had been married and divorced. And they were bringing this up to me and they were kind of talking about it. So I could have withheld the truth from them, right? I could have just kept my lips shut, not said a word, and they may or may not still be here to this day. I don't know. But they probably would have come back. I can't do that. I told them the truth. I showed them the scripture. And I, and I showed them what the Bible says and what Jesus Christ said about, about divorce and remarriage. And I explained the Bible to them. I tried to do it tactfully and in love. You know, speaking the truth in love as the Bible says. But I didn't withhold it from them. And you know what? It made them sad. 
They, they were sorrowful to hear that. But it was needful for them to hear that. And I pray to God that, that you know, even though they're not here with us, that maybe they're still serving God somewhere and that they, they still took it to heart and they received God's word and that even though they didn't come back here, that, that you know, they're not just going to disobey God's word. Um, but regardless, that, that's, not, that's not for the pastor to decide how a person is going to react to you. Your job is to just preach the truth. We can't withhold, and I don't care who you are, whether you're a pastor or not. You don't, you don't get to decide, I'm going to withhold truth from somebody because I don't think they're going to like it. I don't think they're going to receive it. I mean, imagine if you just did that with the gospel. Like, oh, well, this guy's been a Buddhist his whole life, and I think he'll just get offended if I try to tell him about Jesus, so I'm just not going to say anything. <coughs> That'll make him upset. He might get angry with me. He might never talk to me again. No, if you do that, that person's soul is going to go to hell. Well, okay, let's say it's a saved person. You know, their soul isn't going to go to hell, but, I mean, do you really want God to just be chastising them and disciplining them? I mean, wouldn't you, if you were heading down a path and you just were ignorant, you didn't even know God's word, wouldn't you rather have someone tell you in advance and say, hey, look, don't do that. The Bible's telling you not to do that. As opposed to just doing it and then suffering the consequences of your actions later because you just completely disregarded God's word or because you, 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 know, you didn't even know it but you still sinned against God. That's why it's so important to, just to, to preach the truth and that's what Jesus did. I mean, we, there's another example of another person who chose the same exact thing. And I'm never going to change on that. We all need to hear the truth from God's Word. We need to hear every single last line of God's Word. And sometimes it's going to make you sorry. Sometimes it's going to make you sad. Sometimes it might even make you angry. I don't know. Hopefully not. Hopefully we could just be humble and have a humble hearts and just be able to receive God's Word for what it is and just make the changes necessary in our life. But that's not always going to be the case. So, either way, the truth needs to be preached. The truth needs to be spoken from God's Word. Let's keep reading here. I'm almost done. Um, I, I already hit the main points that I wanted to hit in this chapter. Verse 8 says, And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He's talking about the Comforter. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to, the, to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. We have, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you and he's saying when the Holy, when the comforter has come, he is going to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And people are always telling Christians, oh, don't judge. Uh, you know what? I think the next time I'm going to say that, it's not me judging, it's the comforter that's judging. Because that's what he was sent here to do. And guess what? He's inside of me. The Holy Spirit is inside of me because I'm saved. And the Holy Ghost is sent to come and reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. All of those things are going to come from the Holy Ghost. So don't, don't tell me that we can't preach hard against sin because that's the job of the Holy Spirit. And any pastor who's not preaching hard against sin, they're not spirit-filled. They don't have the boldness to say what they need to say. Or, it's, I mean, this is what the Comforter came to do, to reprove the world of sin. And if they're not doing that, well, that was the Comforter's job. Let's keep reading here, verse 13. Or verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you. You cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. Um, pray to God for guidance in truth. Because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, when you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit, you can now understand the Bible. He will guide you into truth. And before you get saved, the, the book, your blinders are on, you, you can't really understand what this Bible is saying. But once you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps you to understand these things. He's going to guide you into all truth. The Bible says in James 1.5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. 
You want to know more from God's Word? You want to gain more wisdom? Pray to God and ask Him for it. And ask Him that the Holy Spirit will just teach you more and more and more and get in and dig into God's Word. And He'll teach you that. The Bible says in 1 John 2.27, But the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you. Talking about the Holy Spirit. And ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in Him. You don't need another man to tell you to explain the Bible unto you. You don't need that. If you have the Holy Spirit, you can learn and, and get teaching and, and, and understand God, God's Word with you and the Holy Spirit. Now, does that make it wrong to go and learn from another man? No, of course it doesn't. That we come to church, we come to church to learn. You're taught from the pastor. But it's not like I'm going to be able to tell you something that you couldn't learn on your own with the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Hopefully not, at least. I mean, if it is, if there is anything like that, then it's not coming from God. If it's only something that I can teach you and you would never be able to get it on your own by reading the Bible and having the Holy Spirit show it to you, then it's not of God. Everything that I teach is something that you should be able to read the Bible for yourself, study it, and be able to come up with this exact same thing on your own. It shouldn't be some new word of truth, some new, some new revelation that God has given to me. It's some, no, it's something that, that you can get just as well as I. And um, in Acts 17, 11, the Bible says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Um, if you want to get the truth, you want the Holy Spirit to work through you, you've got to be searching the scriptures. You've got to be reading for yourself and get that in yourself. Let's jump down here in John 16. I'm really trying to wrap it up here quickly. Because um, he, he basically explains to him that he's going to go and that um, a little while you shall see me and again a little while you shall not see me. Because I go to the Father. He's just, he's just explaining that he's going to be crucified. He's going to be dead. He's going to be buried. And that you're going to be sad. Yeah, but then I'm going to come back. And, um, and you're going to have joy. So then in verse number... Um, so this, we'll keep starting in verse 20. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. The world's going to be glad because they hated Jesus. But you're going to be sad. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. I think this is exactly the way it's going to be at, at Jesus Christ's second coming. Right? When Jesus Christ comes back, we're going to be going through trials and tribulation, and it's going to be really, really rough. So just as a woman who's, who's about to give birth, she's in labor and she's experiencing those pains, which I've never felt before, but I've been with my wife when all three of our children were born and she's gone through some, ex, some excruciating pain in that, in that giving birth. But it's, ama it's amazing for all of the pain where she thinks she can't even take it anymore and she's had enough and I can't do this and she gets to the end of her rope with, with, that, with that experience of, of the pain and what she's feeling and going through, that tribulation that she's experiencing. When that baby's born, all of that is gone. All of that. And it's, it's pure joy and happiness and crying tears of joy because a baby's just been born. And that's all of the love and attention, everything. All of the pain and suffering is just gone out of mind, not even a thought anymore when, at that instant when that baby's born. And I think that's the way it's going to be when we see Jesus Christ coming in the clouds because we're going to be going through so much hardship and trials and things are going to be rough and we might be hungry and there's people coming after us and we've got to be looking over our back all the time or whatever, you know, whatever the situation is going to be, Jesus Christ is going to come and it's going to be like we could forget all of those worries, all of those troubles, whatever the tribulation is, because Jesus is here to save us. It's all just going to go away. And he's going to be there. It's going to be an amazing moment. But um, <clears throat> he's explaining that that's how they're going to feel when, when they see him again, which they did after he was resurrected. Because they were sorrowful, they were sad, you know, they were, they were grieving when he, after he died, but when he rose again from the dead and they saw him, they were, they were extremely full of joy. I think it's going to be the same exact way at the end of the world. Let's keep reading here, verse number um, 22. He says, And ye, ye now therefore have sorrow, 
but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. He's comforting them again, telling them to pray to God. Look, God will give it to you. Ask in my name, and he'll give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. When you're going through trials and tribulations and hardships and sorrows, pray to God. Pray for him to do things. For pray, pray for God's help. Ask, and ye shall receive. If you don't ask God, you're not going to receive. Ask him, he says, and you shall receive. That your joy may be full. God, want, God doesn't want you to not be happy. I mean, sometimes it has to happen, depending on what, what we're going through, but he, it's not that he doesn't want you to be happy. Uh, verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs. But I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you. Because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answering them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So he's, telling, he's explaining to him now, look, you believe me now? It's good. But the hour is coming, and it's basically here. He says, you guys are all going to leave me. I'm going to be left alone. But, and this is something that we can take as a little bit more comfort. Because Jesus said, you know what? I'm not really going to be alone, though, because my Father's going to be with me. When you're doing what's right, I, I don't know how things are going to go, and especially in the Great Tribulation. I mean, for all I know, we could be separated from each other. You could be separated from your family. You could be cast into prison. You could feel very, very alone. You could feel alone even now, being with someone that you love. Sometimes you could just kind of feel distance from them, feel separated, but you're never alone. And hopefully you don't. You know, if you're married, you have a spouse. You know, hopefully you should, you should have a good connection. But um, you know, wh whatever whatever may happen, Jesus Christ was physically left alone by all of his disciples, all of his best friends in the world, the people that spent three years, a little over three years of their time with him, like day in and day out, and doing this work and working together and and being in these great struggles. And you know, they, I'm sure they had great bonds with him with by going through a lot of hardships and trials. You know, if you have ever had any friends and you, you both went through a very traumatic experience together, it kind of builds that relationship and kind of build a, a special bond between you. Jesus had a lot of those things with his disciples because they went through a lot of stuff. There was all kinds of, of crazy things going on where he's performing his miracles and walking on water and they're in these storms on the sea. And I mean, it's just amazing things that are happening with Jesus Christ that they all went through him with. So really close friends. And they all forsook him and fled and ran away from him. Every single one of them. It's a sad moment. It's a sad time. You could kind of, you feel, you know, betrayed. And, and Jesus was betrayed by one of his so-called friends. Stabbed him in the back. He's a traitor. That's a very sorrowful time. It could get you depressed. It could get you sad and lonely. But look at the words of Jesus. He said, I'm not alone. The Father's with me. And remember that. We have the Comforter. We have the Holy Ghost. Jesus has not le le left us comfortless. And no matter what you're going through, seek that solace, seek that comfort from the Holy Ghost and pray to God in Jesus' name to receive blessings so that your joy may be full. When, whenever those hardships are, don't, don't go the opposite direction and turn your back on God and get away from church and get away from serving Him because you're so sad and depressed. Don't do that. That's the worst thing you can do. It's only going to make your problems worse. Stick with it through the fiery trials, through the tribulations that we're going to experience and, um, and you'll come through like gold in the end. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for your words of encouragement and for the Holy Ghost that you've given unto us, which believe 
God, I pray that you would please help us to, to prepare ourselves, prepare ourselves for, for tribulations and trials and for um, events that are going to happen in our lifetime, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to um, expose these lies, to, to always speak the truth, dear Lord, even if it makes people sad or uncomfortable or angry, dear Lord, that we would just preach the truth because that's how we love people is by telling them the truth, not withholding your words from them, dear Lord. I pray that you please give us the boldness to do this and um, God help us to just to be able to teach other Christians and expose the lie of the, the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine that's, that's out there and that's so pervasive in the churches of America these days, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us to wake other people up to this great truth so that they won't be offended. At, at the time of troubles, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.